Welcome to Café Rollist, a uh, very special guest today. Uh, I've interacted with him uh, on a couple of occasions, but he was always running around being extremely busy, so I never dared interrupt him on the, to have him on my microphone, but today is the opportunity. John, could you introduce yourself uh, briefly before we, we dwell into that uh, to, with our viewers? Well, uh, my name's John Dodd, and uh, I've run quite a few of the conventions to do with gaming in the UK. Um, I help out with a number of other conventions. In fact, it's all conventions, every bit of it, which has made this year interesting. So well, you were yeah. asking me about all the questions I ask on the show. Uh, I got my two ice-breaking question is, uh, what's your routine like at the moment uh, with the stuff you're working on and, and also COVID happening. What what does that look like a, a day in the life of John Dodd? It hasn't changed that much to be fair. Um, it turns out that all the jobs I can do, no matter how much people told me they couldn't, can be done from home. So pretty much everything is now operating out of the office. And um, that's both a good and a bad thing because the day job is um, yeah, not friendly to humans. So um it's one of those things. I'd, I'd rather not have my day job interspersed with what I am outside of my day job. Um, most people haven't seen the difference, which is good. Um, but yeah, basically it, it hasn't it hasn't changed. You get up, you work out in the morning, lift weights, do much else. Avoid cardio as much as humanly possible. <laughs> that's this is the way forward. That's thought. easy at the moment. Uh, so <laughs> have you picked... You haven't picked any new interest or hobby lately, except maybe running a convention online. Well, I got bored halfway through, so I learned how to beat one of those. And then I learned how to beat one of those. Oh, so you... And so I'm, for people I'm not who cannot... the 4 by 4 there's no way. It's just not going to happen. For people who don't have the... Records. For people who don't have the image, uh, you were showing some Rubik's Cube, a 4x4. Oh, four it's a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube and a 3x3 three three Rubik's Cube, which I, I'm assured the world record is about 3 seconds and then 7 seconds or thereabouts. So I don't think I'm in any danger of that one. But there was the thought of, sod it, I'll find something else to do as well. So that's, and of course, uh, for those who can't see, it's a bonus because cutting your own hair is also a COVID skill. Yeah, uh, I need to cut my wife's hair, but uh, it, I'm not very good at that. So it's I'm more like doing a straight line in the back, and uh, and that's that is it. All your friend. <laughs> so, uh, well, the big reason you are here today is that well, I'm a big fan of Dragon Meat. That's my home convention, and you organize uh, Dragon Meat. Can you can you tell us a bit about Dragon Meat? What is it, what is it for the people who are not aware? Well, it's a one day convention has been running since the late 90s well actually it's been running for a, a damn sight longer than that but there was a period where it took a break and then was brought back at the end of the 90s um been helping with it since then basically it's it's primarily a role-playing convention more than it is a board games convention but we are looking to address that in the near future um we cater for three three and a half thousand people um and we're now looking for larger premises because the novotel is not big enough anymore and all it takes is people decide to stay in, and then you're over the fire numbers, and well, this is where we are. But we hold 130 to 150 games on the day. There's going to be less than that this year because COVID. Um, we have a trade hall. Last year was 115 different stands. We have an art show. We have a bring and buy. We have demonstration games, seminars, two seminar schedules last year, as you know. Uh, the podcast zone, which is going from point to point. So, yeah. We try and keep everything in the games field, but we are steadily branching out into the science fiction, fantasy, writing, the other communities. And it's, it's building a place where people can just enjoy what they do and be amongst people who can relate to what they do. So when you come to Dragon Me, if you're a role player, you're absolutely in the right place. If you're a board gamer, there's less of them, but you know something, we're still playing board games. We're still doing everything else. All of us are gamers. And it's providing a nice safe space for everyone to come along, enjoy what they do, see something new, which, you know, this year hasn't been very much of. Which... Something I, I, I often hear from uh, people who attend, especially designers, is that uh, Dragon Meat's been growing, but still has got this sort of intimate scale. So people still have time to interact with one another. I know it's a... Uh, 
it's a meeting opportunity for some businesses. I know uh, the good people at Pelgrin Press use the opportunity of Dragon Meat for having meetings with all the people from there, from their business who are mm -hmm. peppered around the, the the world. So it's a uh, it's a great place. I mean, there's I, I'm I didn't have the opportunity of going to to conventions in the U.S., but you, in Dragon Meat, you could go there and just talk with uh, Robin Dillo or Kenneth Height or pretty much any designer and go and have a few words with them. Everybody's really approachable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, most most people in the gaming industry are approachable. It, it's it's a common understanding. It's not a massive industry. And people think it is, but it's it's really not. There's several people who do a lot of stuff, but it's not. Everyone does a tiny bit. It's there's a small group of people. And those people are the ones that drive everything forwards. And as a result, the second someone says, I'd like to get into that, absolutely. Everyone's on board. Everyone helps. Everyone does what they can. So and the thing behind it being is that keeping it intimate, as you say, that's a, that's a practice we do in pretty much every convention that I work. It's because the minute you lose the contact with people, the minute you become, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Corporate? I guess, yes. yeah. I mean, th this that 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 yeah. whole distance between having people who love the event, care for the event, want to make it go forward. So when you've got your volunteers in, they're all gamers. Every one of them's a gamer. Every one of them knows what the people who come to the convention want to do. So when you ask a volunteer, they'll know what the situation is. They'll know what you're after. They'll know what the score is, and they'll want to help you with it because they too are gamers. And it's making sure you've got that making sure it is a friendly atmosphere, making sure that people who aren't going to be friendly, who aren't going to be inclusive, for want a better phrasing, they don't come to the convention. And if they do and they cause problems, they're gone. We've only had two instances of that in the whole time we've been running it, but it happens. Yeah, it's sad. It, and you need to... Online, we, we call that the, the ban hammer. So I, I guess the more you grow, so the, the more the more effort and work you need to put into that because it's difficult to keep an eye at everything at once. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, you, you get to a, a convention of 100 people, 150 people, you can pretty much manage that with a couple of people, tops. When you get to 3,500, you need people on the floor, you need people on the front, you need several people on the front, you need people watching the rooms, you need people watching the seminars, roving patrols, you need you need everything. And, you know, if you've got to bring them by, be prepared, that'll take 50% of your staff straight away. Oh, really? Wow. Instantly. Yeah, straight away. Massive drain of resources. Is that but because complain it. or just because you need someone no, 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 at the no, no, booth? Because, because the sheer volume of things going through it. Yeah, you, you look at uh, in Expo last year, I think it was £150,000 went through it, or thereabouts. This year, Dragon Me, £15,000 went through it. But you've got to have people, and they bring in, and people will bring in suitcases. Not just one, plural multiple suitcases full of all the games they don't want. They fill it all in. We used a computerized system last year. Thank you, Aircon, for the use of that one. Much appreciated. Thank you, X, for the computers. We're going to be getting our own, but all conventions help all conventions. That's the point. We know we're all in the same thing, so we all help each other where we can. The thing behind it being is that when you've got something like the Bring and Buy, people will... Sometimes they'll bring good stuff. Sometimes they'll pre it reasonably. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they'll bring along a copy of Pandemic and try and send it for 40 quid when you can buy it in the trade hall for 25 it's... yeah that's not selling you know and you get a couple of thousand items through a day you've got to get them in, book them in, sort them out put them on the shelf when someone gets them, pulls the sticker off, does something else with it you're like, nope, right, sticker goes back on whose was this and it takes five or six people all day long doing nothing but bring and buy just to make that work which, you know doesn't benefit the convention at all, but it's what people love. And plenty of money for charity, which that's the way forward. It's interesting, I imagine, uh, a convention. So my, my own professional background, I did a bit of retail. And uh, I mean, there, there's so much going on with retail before the pandemic even happened in terms of mm. what do you do with your space? Uh, a lot of the, the buzzwords for the high street was experiential. So it was not shops where you were selling goods for so much as represent a brand. So it was mm. not about selling something on the spot or having it on, on a shelf. 
But when you take a convention, you got space, which I assume, because I never ran a convention myself, but I assume you got uh, uses, which pays for themselves, pays for the convention. You got spaces, which on themselves, they don't bring money in, but they're important to bring the audience at the convention and make them happy. So, uh, yeah, what, what, how, do, how do you do manage those stuff? Is something like the bring and buy something you do because it attracts people or because it helps pay for, for the convention? It certainly doesn't help pay for the convention. It's a massive drain of resources. Um, people want it, though. So we've got no problem with that. We'll put the resource in. If that's what people want to see, that's fine. Some people come for the bring and buy. But to be fair, you come for the bring and buy, you stay for the rest of the show. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And that's fine. If if you come for the artists, you stay for the rest of the show. You come for the games, stay for the rest of the show. If we only had one thing there, and it was one thing alone, people would be in and out half an hour, an hour at most. In the case of the bring and buy, you'd get the diehards who sit by the bring and buy just waiting for new stock to arrive so they can just rifle through it. But, you know, if you don't have multiple streams of things going on. So this year we experimented, well, 2019, we experimented with two streams of seminars rather than one. Because we found that what we got was the sponsors all get a slot in the seminars. And that's fine. But we had that many sponsors that literally the entire of the seminar slot became this as the sponsors. There was no room for anything else. There weren't any room for design workshops, for ideas, for concept work, for up and coming things from other things. It was all the sponsors. So we said, we've got to do something else with that as well. So we opened up another set of seminars. The demonstration games, the games on demand, games on the hour. So people who don't have the time can just wander in, go, yeah, I've got an hour. Right, no problem at all. That room there. They go, they speak to Lloyd GM. You know Lloyd, I'm sure. And he'll point them in a game. He'll assign a GM to them. He'll get them playing for an hour. Done. Happy days. Those who've got more time, no problem at all. Large role-playing schedule, in you go. We've got demonstration games. There's a lad called Dicey Dave who brings in several suitcases of Lego every year takes him two and a half, three and a half hours to set it up. But he sets up an eight by eight Lego board and then runs one game on that board. Wow. Could we have put a load of things on that table? Yes, we could. Actually, we love Dave. We love that he brings these things in there. You've never seen Cthulhu Lego. Well, we have now. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff that he comes up with. But every year he's there saying, yep, no problem. I want to bring my Lego set. I've thought of this idea. I want to put this on there. Last year, we had Battletech, which was a rolling game that lasted the whole of the convention. You came in, picked up a mech, went out on the field, shot some things, went away, job done. At the end of the day, whoever shot the most mechs up got a prize. So rewinding a little bit uh, back, uh, do you remember your, your first experience of a convention? Which, which convention was it and where and when it was, if it's, it's not indiscreet? No, 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 not at all. Um, Junk on UK. That's mm. when I first became aware of conventions. Um, the legendary Gen Con UK, which is, uh, which is oh, no more. Oh, way back, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, put it in a field in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of tents, and that's what will happen. But, uh, yeah, Gen Con UK, um, early to mid-90s. Yeah, it's just the understanding that actually there's more gamers out there. I was a single parent at the time, so there's the understanding of there wasn't much you could do. So we'd go for one day on the Saturday, my boss was into games, so he'd drive up. I'd go with him. Done. No problem at all. And that's how we started getting into things. Um, we formed a, a game demonstration crew called Team 8. We've disbanded some time ago, but we used to go from convention to convention to convention. And all we'd do is offer games, offer other things. We'd just turn up because we wanted to help. And that's where most of this came from. It's because we wanted to see this improve, want to see the hobby improve, want to see people get more involved. And the only way to do that is to give you time. So that's you know, how yeah. you transition. Back then. So that's how you transition to to being part of running the show and now running the show. Well, uh, let's have a look. So Expo, for example, I think it was the second year where I got involved. Where the first year where they moved into something else. Me and the guys went down. Um, there weren't that many role playing games on, so that's fine, no problem at all. We said, "Yep, do you want some?" The following year, we turned up with the whole team. No problem. Year after that, they said, do you want to keep running this? I'm like, yeah, fine. No problem at all. So we were teammates up until 2011, I think. 
At which point they said, yeah, you know, really, we need to put you on board as Expo rather than as Team 8 working with Expo. And then it went from there. Dragon Meat, well, Chris picked it up several years ago now, came to me immediately and said, can you run this for me? Well, yeah, no problem. And then the other partner in Dragon Meat, uh, Jonathan, good lad, but in his retirement period, so didn't really want to run it anymore. Said he wanted to sell it on. I said, yep, no problem. I'll buy that. No problem whatsoever. And it's been me and Chris since then. So Long Con was an idea I had several years ago. Um, because when I was younger, we had more time. So you, you told me to before we recorded, but what is Long Con uh, actually for, for people who are not so aware? Long Con. Um, it's a convention I organized from some years ago where the idea is to come in and have one game to play across the entire weekend. So, for example, we had one group that came in, uh, it was 2015, no, 2016, Steve Ellis, excellent GM. Um, he came in and he ran the entire of the Dracula dossier. Wow. Start to finish. He'd done six months of prep prior with the group, and then they came in to finish it off at Longcon, which was brilliant for me. Because when they came in, we gave them the veranda, so they got the nice open area, they got the nice sun, everything else. Sun and a vampire game. But it worked. I came in at the end of Sunday. It would have been five o'clock. It was the last part of the game. They were literally down to one PC and one other PC. One of the PCs had been turned into a vampire because they had to. And it was down to single dice rolls as to who would win, the vampire PC or the other PC. Now, I'm going to leave it for someone else to say what happened, but it was super. It was just wonderful to have that sort of game there. And when you've got people who've been playing for 20 or 30 years going, best game ever. Perfect. That's what you're after in a convention. It's when people are going out the door, they go, that was brilliant. I'll come back next year. I had a great time. That was wonderful. It's, it's all about giving people the good time. And yeah, you've got to keep building on that. Longcon has the unique problem in that if you have a group of players and they don't like each other, you've got a real problem because yeah. you've only got one game like at Expo, at Dragon Me, if something goes wrong with the game, I could say, yep, no problem. Okay, look, hey, I'll refund that. No problem whatsoever. I'll get you in a different game. Job done. No problem at all. With Long Con, you've only got that game. Yeah, it reminds they me... They don't I, like it. <laughs> I did stuff like that in a... We, we would call it a, a 24 hours uh, at a, a small role-playing RPG club uh, in Belgium, in Namur, called La Crypt. If, Ever anyone from La Crypt is listening to that? I, I really doubt it. But uh, it was it was like four, maybe six tables running in parallel, but they would be running all the same uh, adventure and we'll yeah. have break and you would not spoil each other's game, but we'd also say, so what, what are you doing now? What are you doing? But yeah, 50% uh, of the time, because, you know, it was not a exactly curated event it was more organized i mean it was still organized but um, yeah it was not professional game well not not professional either i mean the game master were were what they were so you had a 50 50 chance of ending up on a table where it it really gelled and a 50 percent mm. chance of being in a, in a table where uh yeah one of my worst games were were there it was not that terrible but yeah there there was a friend of the game master at the table and he was the star of the game and we were all yep. <laughs> doing cameos in there and i was just very happy to die before the end and go watch another game which was going on a, a little bit better mm -hmm. it's never fun being a bit player in your own movie is it yeah well uh, we got uh, Mira from the Podcast Zone in the, in the chat room, and she's asking questions. Uh, she's asking, uh, who's your so far current favorite convention guest, and what who would be your dream convention guest? Favorite convention guest? John Robertson. No question. Um, there is a man for all convention organizers everywhere. Pay attention. There's a guest that will muck in with your volunteers and move tables for you. Wow. There's a man who joins in with the guests. There's a man who joins in with all the people there. There's a person who you can... Don't let him near the baked beans. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Don't ever let him near the baked beans. But without hesitation, John Robertson. Brilliant lad. 
would have him at every convention in the world without any problem at all. He's superb. Um, dream guest. It depends on which convention, really, doesn't it? Well, yeah. Um, well, for Dragon Meat, I guess that's the the centerpiece today. For Dragon Meat, um, we're not big enough. Not yet. Not really. We've had um, John Kovalik, who's been with Dragon Meat for so many years, um, and he he become almost a staple of the convention. It wouldn't be Dragon Meat without him. Robin Laws, Ken Hyde, these are people who have been with Dragon Meat forever. So it, you know, it, it it's not Dragon Meat without them. We don't consider them so much as guests as the family of the convention. Well, like Ian, I thing. guess, uh, uh, who's uh, there every year. Ian Livingston, so. absolutely. Yeah. Again, it, it wouldn't be, you know, th these are people that form the, the bulk of it, the mortar of the actual convention. You don't consider them guests in the same way they are. Absolutely. No problem at all. By the definition, they are guests. But I don't see them as guests in that way because they always do so much. They enjoy the convention themselves. And it's difficult to see them as guests when you're doing it like that. When you're looking at a guest, you're looking at bringing someone in who's never been, who's, you know, who doesn't do these things very often, who maybe hasn't been to England that often, you know. Vin Diesel walks past, yep, no problem at all, no <laughs> worries, we'll have him, no problem. But, you know, it's it's a case of, in a lot of cases, it's cost versus return for guests. Because you've got to look at it from the point of view that if you want to get, say, for example, Neil Gaiman, we can't afford him. Spoke to his agent, we absolutely can't afford him, no two ways about it. And that's fine, no problem at all, we understand that. But a lot of people, when you speak to the agent, you can't get them. You either know them or you know them as a friend of a friend of a friend or smaller conventions and i count dragon meat amongst those you can't afford them it's as simple as that like world cons have the, the expense for coming to the convention itself is far higher so that's fine but in return you've still got to get the guests across you've got to fly them over and the cost for a single guest from the us is almost as much as running the convention yeah Which, and there's the sort of a logistical I mean, it's kind of a catch-22, I assume, because you need a certain attendance to be able to afford or attract some yep. types of guests. And then those guests show up and they bring even more attendance, but that's not without logistical issues. I, I thought it was really fascinating. Uh, I recorded an episode at uh, MCM Comic Con when uh, the cast of Critical Role showed up there. And it yeah. raised so many questions in terms of how you manage that because they, I mean, they faced a, a really tough challenge. They were too mm -hmm. small for the people that Critical Role attracted. At the same time, they, they were, you know, they were a niche within a niche. So suddenly you've got, I don't know, 30% of your attendees who are there specifically for one thing. So they don't spread out across your panels. They will all show yeah. up at your peak hour on a single panel and yep. and you know people who are having discussions could could would critical rule be better suited for expo or something like that and it's my personal view was that it wouldn't even work expo is I, there's not enough room for the critters there i think critical rule need their own convention almost i mean if you maybe if they would come one by one rather than as a group but yeah, they were supposed to come back before the pandemic to MCM, but I think the, it mm -hmm. seemed that the strategy of MCM was to invite almost just them this year and nobody else because they did not announce any other guests. It's yeah, it's it's not easy. People think it's easy. You just have that person and then you sort it. No, because then you got lines, no. you got people who are frustrated, you got people who travel from far away and then they they sad because mm -hmm. they cannot have the experience they were wishing for, and it's. I mean, it's somebody's fault, but yet it's nobody's well, you, fault. You look it's at it from the point of view that when we brought over the Dice Tower uh, the first time they came over for Expo, and we had a seminar room that could hold 300 at the time, and the queue was around the block. So we had someone walking down the queue going, yep, no problem at all. Okay, so unless someone comes out, everyone past this part isn't going to get in the com isn't They're not going to get in the room. And we made that clear to them as they're walking around. There's that whole thing of, yeah, look, seriously. Unless someone else drops out of the queue now, you won't get in. And it's telling them ahead of time so they can plan something else. But even then, when the second thing came around, those same people were in, 
And several of the people who'd come in from the first one, who'd seen the first one, ran forward and came for the second one as well. So you're like, and there's no way to stop people. When you're in a convention above a, a thousand people, you can't stop the same people jumping in line again and again and again and again and again. And you cannot so have... It's, it's, yeah, and it's, it's good to say to people, look, you know, please give someone else a chance. The simple truth is most people don't. And even if you could create a, a seminar room for, I don't know, a thousand people out of thin air uh, in the middle of your convention, which already is not happening, uh, that means that when the Dice Tower is not there, that room is sitting uh, empty because... No, you, you never leave an empty room. No, you you never. Yeah, but leave an empty room. you're the room you need to to reconfigure. Yeah. You need to move the the chairs away and back in for for the next seminar. You need to put the in trick third partitions. With all of it is to make sure that the room you're using is used for that purpose throughout the entire day. Yeah, exactly. So because if you if you do that, you can ensure that whatever you're doing, even if you move them out, then bring them back in a short while later, you're still using the same setup, same ideas, same concept, same room. Because the minute you start moving stuff around while everyone else is in. No, it's a nightmare. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I meant because it. with Critical Rule, they, they, I think that I don't know how many people you could fit in there, but it was like one of, you know, top, temporary events like that. Often you end up with something which is the largest cinema theater of the UK for for just a weekend, and you had this mm -hmm. place which was too small for the critters, but which was way too big for the panel with. Uh, yep. The cast of Slaughterhouse, the cast of Shadowhunter, or a lineup mm -hmm. of comic book artists who included, a, pff, I don't know, the Grant Morrison, the, or, you know, very pe mm -hmm. people who are very talented and famous, but still they were mm -hmm. not enough to to match that demand for no, that space. Mm. It's, uh, it's often a problem, and that is the thing. So, so uh, but if we could ever get Critical Role over, I'd be happy to see them. Don't get me wrong, but. Accounting for you know, I've I've seen how much other podcasts take to get across, and and how many how much money you've got to put forward for them as well. So when we can afford them, absolutely, we'll take a look at it. But by then, hopefully, we'll be in somewhere like Excel. Yeah, and we'll actually have the space to do it because if another thousand people turn up at Dragon Meet and we're in the Novotel, the hotel takes one look and goes closed. Yeah, because. It and it's not. It's, you can't do anything with it. It's not that people are not welcome. So also, sometimes attendees don't realize that uh, mm -hmm. there are safety <laughs> standards, and you and safety standards are there for a reason. You you don't want to have uh, four hundred people in a two hundred people uh, room. Mm -hmm. But this year you don't have this issue. You know, good news, bad news, <laughs> because you're moving bad online. News, bad news. So, so how was this decision taken, and uh, how, how do you see that that situation of moving online? Is it is it all bad, or do you see that as an opportunity to to try different stuff? We can try different things. Um, we are trying different things. We're we're looking at Twitch options. We're looking at YouTube channels. We're looking at a variety of online seminars. We're looking at online games. Um, things that you'll miss in a virtual convention: the trade hall more than 50%, I would easily estimate, of most people who come to Dragon Meet, and indeed most conventions, they come for the trade hall. A trade hall can't be duplicated virtually. No matter uh, what you do with it. Can't do it? Well, on, tell me. I actually... Tell me how you do it. Tell me how you would do what? the idea of going to a stall, picking something up and say, I want this. This looks awesome. Well, and I, I can actually, walk away with it now. That's one of the things I've got in project to do a, a, a panel about. I attended several online conventions, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to make a panel with a couple. Uh, I thought did some interesting concepts, which are these are still young concepts. But one of the conventions I did not attend, but I already received. Uh, which one was it called? Uh, it was in Ohio, but they were focused on the trade halls. So that was about craftsmen etc so i'm very curious to see how their convention went and for them to to tell a bit what was their experience and see if this experience could be picked up by other conventions uh, another convention uh, which i attended is a french one cybercon uh which mm -hmm. cyberconv actually not con because con doesn't it's not a good word in french uh cyberconv uh what they do and it's not 
it's not perfect. Don't get, don't get me wrong, but again, the the testing stuff um, is that they got a Discord and traders, designers can have uh, channels, rooms, and they are actually gonna have one for the second edition. Uh, mm -hmm. So I will have a, a channel room and I hang out there and people can show up and when they show up I say hello uh, I'm this person I'm doing this this is my product this is my design uh, want you have a look and I have a conversation so you don't have the shelf you don't have the thing that people can pick up but you have the person there behind the table so you could have eventually your your grant it and you you run into him and you start discussing about what he does and in the process he manages to to sell a few copies which is not it's not perfect uh, i also seen uh, some convention in the us in which they made a, a very simple nothing super fancy crazy more, more something like looking like the the old zelda games uh on the super nintendo or the old nintendo but that was mm -hmm. your your whole and you move your character there and when you enter a room which is visually represented you've got the chat and the audio of that room mm -hmm. so you could have the the experience of browsing so so i think all of that is very exciting because it's very experimental uh mm -hmm. what what i yeah that's why i'd like to organize a panel about that because i i'm not sure there's a lot of awareness yet of what's happening in different conventions, especially it's happening on in smaller conventions, because I, I believe bigger conventions, uh, they, they got already so much stuff to deal with just moving online that they don't really have the space to start to behave like, I don't know, a, a startup which which experiments with crazy concepts and so on. When, when you are, I don't know, Gen Con, or origins that you got so much on your plate already and such There's a... an expectation of what you must deliver before mm. you can try something else yeah exactly so and and the base minimum of what you must deliver has to be you've got no choice around that if you had a dragon meet and there were no role-playing games nope nope it's not working you know so... what i mean can't do it yeah we, we can we can get away with different seminars we can get away with different things different demonstration games different artists, you know, reduce, increase the bring and buy. If you took away role-playing games, nope. No, that's the core of it, really. Use, yeah, half the people of it straight away. With the online things, absolutely no problem at all. You can look at it, and from the point of view of several people who are, I think the phrase digital natives, people who are actually grew up with the internet, the ideas, all the other things like that, it makes perfect sense. When half the demographic is people my age and above who aren't digital natives, we may have taken to it, but we're not we, we remember when the internet didn't exist. So there's that whole thing of, right, so I'm moving this character around a screen. Okay. All right. No problem. But then you want to go through the door and you want to be seeing the people in front of you. So it's then got to be a, a live stream for the person in front, which is fine. But then they've got to stay on that the whole day just in case someone shows up in their shop. And yep. when they do, do you now have grid view like this thing? 60 people in the shop all typing in questions or speaking at the same time well, if... while the person on the other side is going well that's that's where also it's interesting in terms of scale because like with a physical scale you've got a, a critical mass of people which can be a good mm -hmm. or a bad thing if you don't have a cr certain critical mass you cannot afford so certain you have a social things convention don't you so you have the understanding if you've got a two meter table you get four people in front of it yeah if two more people want to talk They'll either wait or they'll do the whole, excuse me, can I, with a virtual convention, you've got unlimited people right at your door right then. Well, you, now, you can I'd, limit I'd, if that. If someone's come up with an idea of dealing with that, I'd love to hear that. I mean, I, I mean, believe... seriously, get in touch. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. I really yeah, but... would. That, that's the thing. Yeah, I think I that's, that's the difficulty. You got people with the knowledge or they're, they're developing the tools right now, but they are not widely known and and out there so but but i seen instances when and you need the agreement of people for that also but uh instances where you had yep. not only chat rooms for for uh, discord games and mm -hmm. those are limited in number or you can even limit the the access of people with, with a password or an ID, uh, identification they cannot get in without mm -hmm. being invited so that limits mm -hmm. your your tables but i also saw some convention in which you had the tables playing but people at the option or even a, a live stream or conversation happening and on, on twitch and having the room on discord as well 
but people could get in the room, but they were muted. So you could at go in a panel, be there, but be muted until the moment of the Q&A and whoever is hosting the, the thing can right click on an individual say, okay, yeah. raise your hand, which is one thing also mm -hmm. some chat software do or don't yeah. having the raise hand stuff. And, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the IT specialist either i'm just an end user but i, f I find it fascinating that these similar. things are developed um, there's another show that i'm part of called lessons of wonder which does a variety of different panels on different subjects mostly scientific <laughs> and we have something on there where you have and that takes a crew of four or five minimum usually seven or eight just to make sure you've got all the different things going at the same time but that includes one person monitoring the chat one person making sure there's nothing going on bad one person making sure inappropriate comments are not coming up because they stream past at phenomenal rates of knots. And all it takes is someone just starts typing in the wrong word, goes straight off, but someone will see it. And it's it's keeping people safe, even when you've got this sort of thing. In person, there's that brief thing of one person can look over a room of 100 and go, yep, everything's fine. No problem at all. You can see immediately if there's a problem. When you're online, you can't always see it. Yeah, it's, it's developing the visibility so that you can work in the same way, so you can have the same safety as everything else. So say, for example, we all remember the incident at UK Games Expo. Yep, for people who are not aware, uh, <laughs> but uh, we won't go into the details. But... Exactly so, but that got reported through Twitter. Yeah, I someone know, which was... Someone That's eventually came to me and said, are you aware of this? And I'm like, I was not. Give me a second, I'll go have a look. I did. Four hours later, it was resolved. Should it have ever happened? No. But we were on top of it. And the second we were made aware, we were on it. That's the beauty of having a physical convention, is that you can be on top of it in that way. Online, if someone doesn't mention it, if someone doesn't say it, you know what I mean? If the first thing you get is someone saying, by the way, do you know about this? you might be too late. You, you might not have had a chance to get in there fast enough to do something. It was two hours from the event going on to when I was made aware. Within an hour, I've got it locked up, but that's my concern. It's that you've got a lot of things that slip through the gaps because it's still emerging technology. It's still an emerging idea. But there, it's interesting because... go online. But what, the incident you mentioned, you've got this sort of a overlap between a, a online environment which is twitter and uh, the physical environment and sort of the the challenge was that it was reported online but not to, to your uh on-site team but uh mm -hmm. online conventions and actually i already had an episode uh, of cafe rollist about that with cyberconf uh they had a, a very good team really on top of uh, moderating things on their discord and they the, you even could identify individuals that like well like like your team they got the yellow t-shirts or the red t-shirts uh, when you are dragon meat uh they had a, a special badge next to their name saying okay they're part of the moderating team mm -hmm. so you see you would see them patrolling the the mm -hmm. discord and on its own according to the report uh, we, we we got from the convention it, on its own it was already helping with the moderation just having those people show up and people know that mm -hmm. they are an agent of, of safety so people felt safer and if anyone was a troublemaker they would see them and refrain from trying to to troublemake at, at that point but what what but it's that's strictly online uh, with expo it was both online and digital but what's interesting and i i think is a, it's probably a big challenge i i would assume for dragon meat and another convention is that you've got a team who are the cyberconf the advantage was that they started from scratch with their team so they made a team of people who are digitally focused and minded because it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a different skill sets and someone who's very good and very personable in person at dragon meat uh, might not have an interest or the skills to do the same type of uh, function in an mm -hmm. online setting because then suddenly, oh, you, I need to learn how Discord works and how I I, I mute someone or kick ban someone. It's, I can really imagine someone being not interested in that. I know 
I know I wouldn't. I would be much more interested in doing stuff person to person rather than than online. So are you? Yeah. What, what's going on with the organization at this point? Are there stuff you can already tell us uh, about Dragon Meat, about what you're doing and planning, or is it still well, too undef underdefined? So we've already put the virtual trade hall into place. Uh, we're now going to be getting the upgun links, the, the images, all the other bits and pieces. We can't do what Expo did with the individual rooms for people, with the individual setups and everything else. To be fair, not as many people use them as should have done, but it was one of those things. Had to try it, had to see how it worked. With Dragon Meat, we literally, we don't have the automation, we don't have the money to do it. So we said, yep, yeah, no problem. Look, we'll provide the links to the trade hall, which will provide links to the site. If you guys want to do something on that, that's fine. If you've got special events that you're running, that's fine. No problem. Tell us. We'll put them up there. If you're running a Discord chat at this time, if you're running a Zoom chat at some time, if you're doing something else, if it's a presentation, if you're doing a Twitch stream, something else, anything at all, let us know. And we'll put it on the site for you. We'll let you know. We'll, we'll brief it out to everybody. We'll tell people this is what's going on on the day. No problem at all. With the games, yep, no problem. We opened submissions last week. We've had nine so far. To put that in perspective versus a normal Dragon Meat, we'd have had 90. Mm -hmm. So tenfold. Massive difference. Yeah. And people are less interested at the moment in running games online. Um, they've got their own groups. They've got their own things. They, A lot of people, a lot of the older GMs that I know, a lot of people who've been running things at conventions for years, because as you say, when you're next to someone, when you can see them, you can see when your players are having a good time, you can see when they're not. As opposed to a screen where if what you've actually got and you see it is this, you can't tell what they're doing. You don't know what they're doing. You, you've, If they're not saying anything, you can't even tell if they're still there. And a lot of the GMs that I know have had the whole, I don't like doing this online. What I'm used to is working with people in a close environment. And as a result, a lot of people have... have a lot of people I know have retreated completely from it. A, a lot of people, don't get me wrong, have gone down the line of, yep, this is fantastic. I can now game five days a week without any problem whatsoever. It's marvelous. No problem whatsoever. And as, as Mira will, I'm sure, tell you, we've got a game being sorted out between me and several friends there. They all live in London. I live in Yorkshire. No problem at all. So looking forward to that. Really am looking forward to that. But for a lot of people, because it's new, because it's emerging technology, because it's so different from anything they've done before they don't want to do it and convention gming is a different thing to running games for your friends mm, yeah. and when you turn up and you could have people from all over the world in that game and you just don't know and the uncertainty gets to a lot of people so i expect numbers to be low but we're doing what we can so, so people aren't sure we do what we can and i mean the rest of the things obviously we've got the seminar tracks going on we're keeping with those we are looking at a Twitch option. We've got several people who volunteer to help us with this. We are looking to proceed with that one. We thought about the bring and buy. The simple truth is we can't I, engineer something. It can't be done. I, I really don't see... I don't. I haven't heard of any convention doing a bring and buy uh, online. Uh, no. That's something I unheard of as far as I'm We concerned. thought about it. There are options wow. that we could do, and there are options how we could do it. The problem that you've got with any bring and buy, with anything at all, is that when you've done it, you've effectively compromised eBay. What you've said is no problem at all. Here's a one-day eBay. No problem whatsoever. If you guys want this, no problem. Bid the price. Off you go. Now, we can do that, but... There's can you? I mean, can, can, the, isn't that a massive work yeah, to create a platform like eBay, it's even a, small yeah, one? It's, it's a massive amount of work. No, not, not the same size as eBay, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah it, it's you know, some, the whole thing something like a massive this endeavor. Game for this price. Yeah. But then you've got to do all the coding for that, all the other stuff for that, everything yeah. else. And whatever you make for charity, the convention still lost several thousand pounds building the software platform, which we're not going to be able to get anything back from. I think that um, it's you look at you know other options that we've got. I mean, the demonstration games. I'd I'd love to have the Lego game still running, but it will be the Lego game as shown through a zoom lens, which isn't the same. A Minecraft um, game. <laughs> You I mean, that could it. be a thing. That's a thing, but that's somebody else. That's that's the thing. It's not exactly. the the nice individual the thing, who does the Lego game each year. It's somebody else with your phone who's doing something completely different. Uh, who offers? But it, it's not the same people. Exactly. You change your audience. You change your, the people who deliver what they want to see. 
it's a completely different yeah. event. Yes, it is. And that's the thing. So it's it's new stuff. It's emerging technologies. We're doing what we can with it. But as I said, for me, like for you, virtual events don't work the same. No, no. They don't I, have the same feel. They don't have, for example, most people who work conventions, any you know degree of conventions, the ones who do the lifting and shifting, the ones who do all the other stuff, all the volunteers in yellow, all the volunteers in black, all the guys with the dragon meat shirts on, which, by the way, all the Dragon Meat volunteers this year, who are called the choir, are all getting their call sign t-shirts because we needed to do that for them. Because oh. it isn't about the people who help us this year. It's about all the people who got us to the stage where we can be what we are. So what was going to happen with Dragon Meat this year is everyone was going to be getting call sign t-shirts. So a new t-shirt, and on the back is your call sign. And the idea behind it being is the person picks the call sign, and that's it. That call sign never goes to anybody else, ever. They will forever be you know, Maverick at Dragon Meat. That's that person. And there'll be a list on the website of who was what and everything else. And it's, it's things like that. So when people leave, you get to 10 o'clock Saturday night. The auction's finished. Everything else is finished. People are going out. The crew is mostly exhausted. We're all sat down. We're not doing very much because nope. But we're watching people go out. They're smiling. They've had a good time. That smile our people are happy the people we've done this for are happy and that's what makes it worthwhile that's what makes it all worthwhile what happens with the virtual convention is people go ah, done now i don't agree i had i had one convention which went well uh but again it's it's like overnight you're running a Italian restaurant and overnight you're told to serve Chinese food. It's it's a complete, it's still a restaurant, but it's a different experience. It's different skill sets, mm -hmm. different interests. There are different qualities, different issues. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I really look forward to the second CyberConf. I, I, I really wonder if it will be as much of a success as the first one because it ended with a closing ceremony on Twitch. Uh, with people very active in the chat room and so on. So it was really emotional, very nice. But I think also what's happening, and that's why I'm curious about the, the second CyberConf, which uh, arrives uh, uh, pretty soon, actually. Uh, the first CyberConf arrived a couple of weeks after the beginning of the lockdown, which was pretty much the same time in, in the UK. And well, although we didn't have yeah. a, a true lockdown in the UK and, and the one in, in France, uh, there was a lot of energy at that point, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot yeah. of stress and concern, anxiety regarding what's we what was yeah. happening. But the, it was really cathartic to do. Now, including yeah. myself, I'm developing a game. I've been running the game at several conventions. At this point, as we're starting, or oh, we we are in the middle of a second lockdown or second peak, whatever we want to, to call it. Uh, I feel exhausted. Uh, I've been running games at so many conventions. Uh, I've seen many conventions who had the opposite, well, maybe not the opposite problem, but they, they had a lot of tables, but the players would not show up. They had a lot of game masters, but then you had, need to cancel tables. That's what happened at Albacon. Yeah, That's that. what I'm concerned yeah. about Akadecon yeah. and um, uh, Grogmeetish. Yeah. Uh, and, and also at the moment, there's so much competition because on one hand it's nice you can access all the conventions. On the other hand, I got Akadecon happening the same weekend as Metatopia, and then I got Grog Meat issue the next weekend, and then I've got Dragon Meat. It's yep. you know, I guess it's the same. It's 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 different, but I know also mm -hmm. when you run a physical convention, this sort of if you make a new convention, you will need to find your weekend because they are the existing conventions and you don't want yep. conflict. So I know there's some kind of <laughs> negotiation agreement, tacit thing, which, okay, MCM is happening at the same time as UK Games Expo. It's fine, I guess, because it's not the same audience, but yeah, some... No, it's it's, it's a fairly different audience. Yeah. Um, there, are, but... there is some crossover, but it's far less than you might think. Yeah, but, you know, you got this balance. Why right now online convention? It's kind of the the wild west. It's just yeah. all over the place. Everybody's doing their thing at the same time. People are Everything. trying out things. Yeah. You need to you need to find out over years what actually works, which conventions mm -hmm. are actually robust and will 
stay on even hopefully after mm -hmm. the pandemic so but yeah and and i my expectation I mean, is that maybe isn't it when you think about it the some of the conventions that you've got a lot of the things for example a lot of people presume that virtual conventions are free yeah also and that's that's the understanding that's given a virtual convention it's on the internet it must be free done no problem at all no mind to the organizer in the background who has to pay for all the bits and pieces that go together to make that convention People are just going, nope, it's free, fantastic. Conventions are dead. Long live virtual conventions. It's all free. I can do all this from my living room. I'm like, hmm, okay, no worries. Well, that's fine. But what you'll get is whatever people can afford for free. And that's the thing. When people start realizing that virtual conventions are a thing, they won't be free anymore. They won't, they won't be, you know, there may be two or three people who can do it, no problem at all. But you've got to have an absolutely committed volunteer team who are willing to put in their professional time, their professional capability, in times where they may not have jobs themselves. And people are sitting there screaming, nope, we want things for free. It's like, fine, but come on, respect people being professionals. Several of the people that we're looking at for Dragon Meat this year are professionals, and we are paying them as a result. Because I don't expect that anyone goes, oh, well, I, I like that convention, I'll give you my time. You're a professional. You could be earning money elsewhere. You, you're working for us. We'll pay you. That's what it is. And we're not passing that on. But at the same time, you couldn't do it every year. You well, know, you need to... to make Dragon Meat run next year. No problem at all. But if we kept on giving out, say, this lasts, God forbid, another two years. You think about how many conventions will have the money reserves to still be able to put a show on when the world goes back to normal this year we had a plan if if the lockdown had worked the first lockdown had worked we had a plan to bring in masks and shields so you had a mask for everybody you had a shield for everybody and your price to get into dragon meat included a mask and a shield and that was the price that was part of the entry to dragon meat was that you put your mask on you drop the shield down no problem at all we worked out a way to do it. We spoke to some organizers. We spoke to some people who could do it and said, look, I'll need at least 3,000 of these things. Can you do it? They said, yeah, no problem at all. We can do it. No worries. We can subsume the cost into the price of the ticket. And people could then walk around. And if social distancing was there at any point, if there was requirement for a mask and people turned up without a mask, it's like, nope, you're not going in here. Take this mask. Take this shield. In you go. As long as you're in, the shield is down, the mask is up. Are you safe? Yes. Are some people going to be uncomfortable with it? Yes. We've seen this. It happens. But it's what we have to do to keep everyone safe. And that's the key with the conventions. It's keeping everyone safe. They say this may go until next October, in which case Dragon Meat physical may be the first one that comes back next year. We don't know. There's so many things about this that it's, it's such a fluid situation. Eastercon. Yeah, Eastercon coming up. I'm part of the committee for that. And we're looking at a hybrid convention at the moment. Far less people at the actual convention center itself, but a far greater virtual presence as a result. Is it costing? Yeah, it is. It really is. And a lot of people are saying, well, if it's virtual, surely I should be able to attend for free. It's like, no, because we've got to put the software in place and the platforms and we've got to bring the cameras in and we've got to do everything else. And we've got to do that and it costs. We've got to pass that cost on because we can't afford to do that for free. I'm very curious so... to see how many, to see a successful, you know, well-tuned hybrid model mm. because that's something I'm I'm really interested into. But I'd again, it's it's different skills. So f like f funding, uh, I, I was talking with with people who, who run uh, ch charity fundraisers through role playing mm. games, through physical events. And mm -hmm. we were talking about doing it online and I, I was telling them, look, I don't have the experience myself, but I can see that streamers, there are streamers out there who raise a lot of money for charities through their streams mm -hmm. because they, they got the system worked out. Yep. So that, that could be a, a potential income. But mm. that's why I'd be interested in hybrid conventions because one of things I thought was a bit of a pity that you can really tell that there's a, a very large audience who enjoy tabletop role-playing games on Twitch, but as far as I can tell, this audience doesn't show up at physical conventions. And we already 
at this well not not so much not not a large proportion well you could argue in the wider t- tabletop rpg fans how much of a proportion of them attend the physical convention but uh mm-hmm. again that's that's also the the difficulty the critical mass the space the investment is it worth it but I know it's difficult at this stage in the United Kingdom to have streamers do live events at conventions because you you don't really it's not impossible you don't really have the space but I'd be very curious to see there's a physical conventions there are people maybe me <laughs> I'd love to do that who visit booths with a camera webcam or something interview mm-hmm. people it's broadcast on Twitch then it's cut you got a a live actual play happening on Twitch in connection with the convention. Maybe it's on at mm-hmm. the convention. Maybe it's not even at the convention. But if you are at the convention, maybe you got places where you got big screens and you can see the the live actual play. Aircon did something this year. That, that's that's something which would be extremely exciting. But yeah, it's gonna take several years before we got the the recipe right and knowing that okay mm. that's what we need we need the bring and bind to bring people we need the free stream to bring people but then we need the prime submission i don't know to pay for the x thing and this other thing tradable which makes money and a sponsorship and then interestingly that's... enough we saw something last week tuesday of last week we we tuned into the hilton international when they gave their conference talk about how they saw things going and how thing, they saw things moving forwards and everything else. And this was Hilton International that we're talking, so the CEO of Hilton worldwide. And they were saying that they saw hybrid conventions being the future for the next 24 months. Now, we saw the room that they were operating in, and people were spaced at two meters each. So you had one person every two by two block. And we looked at a room that could have held 500, and there were 40 people in it. And so our immediate question was, okay, well, no problem. Most people know that when you go to a hotel, you swap the room, the room nights that you've got for the people staying at the hotel and the food and beverage spend to get the hotel cheaper. Otherwise, you just couldn't afford it. It just wouldn't be possible. But if that hotel can only hold, say, for example, you get one of the Westminster rooms for the, uh, the Hilton and you can get 40 people in that playing games, no problem whatsoever. Socially distanced, you can get 10. Mm-hmm. period when you've got the rooms at full capacity and you've got eight tables of six 48 people, your GMs, your other bits 60 people, or 10 socially distanced are they now going to offer the terms where they can say you can have the whole hotel but we only need this many room nights and this much food and drink because if they're not you can't afford to do those events like that you just can't afford to do it if they say we still want 1,300 room nights. And you're sitting there going, yes, but you're only allowing us to do function space for 200 people. How exactly do you expect us to make that number? So a lot of the chains where they've got this space available, they need to come back with that and say what they think. And so far, I haven't seen very much of that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's... I mean... On one end, it's exciting because it's. I, I was saying the Wild West is the time when people are throwing stuff at the wall and including the sink through the window. And we need to see what sticks. And not only what sticks, but uh, one thing I thought was fascinating at the beginning of the lockdown uh, people started playing a bit more online, including a lot of people who never played online. And I saw a lot of people saying stuff in the vein of, Oh yeah, we're using Roll20. I don't like it very much, but you know what? At my work, we use a collaborative tool, which is a a tool made for all work specifically. Mm -hmm. We started using it to play my games and now I'm coding a version that I could share with other people to play. So Mm -hmm. as as there's a new need and you you start using tools, you find the tools Mm -hmm. are flowed for what you want and you start developing new tools and it becomes more attractive to play online and then you've got a uh, what is it called virtual circle of things so so let's just make it work yeah yeah people make it work that that's the thing and i think the thing also sometimes people are expecting the the perfect thing uh Thing you, you need to try out something, you make it happen. It's more important that something happen and then you perfect it over time rather than, than trying to, to achieve, to, to make those big plans for this perfect thing and then you don't have the business case or it's you not working. Something? If everyone had that opinion in life, conventions <laughs> would do a lot better either way. 
<laughs> but for every idea you put in, every new idea you put in, every, t- every time you change something, doesn't matter what it is, there'll be 10 people that complain and two people that say that was brilliant. <laughs> Even if later 50 people say that was awesome, at the time you'll have 10 people that complain and two people that say that was brilliant. That's a frustrating um, this, dynamic. This is always the way of, it the, is, but yeah. it's, it's life. <laughs> conventions for 25 years, this is what happens. Um, you know, I, I wish it didn't, but it does. Um, you know. Okay, great. Well, uh, we just reached the one hour mark. Dragon Meat is December 5th. Uh, does it yeah. open at 9 a.m. like uh, the physical one? Opens at 9 a.m. We're going to put the trade hall live from 10 a.m. So all the events and everything else are going to be on from there. We're going to be doing updates on the Facebook group, on the Twitter. Thank you, Mira. Um, and a bunch of other things that will be going on from there. So the announcements as they come in will be moved to all the different platforms, which is something Dragon Meat has always been wholly terrible at. I've been because, complaining about that yeah. lately to Mira without knowing that she was involved in the new one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's amazing how this works, isn't it? But mm. this is the thing. At the end of the day, we need to get better with these things. It's, it's always a thing. We're all busy, but we don't have that choice. At the top of this, Dragon Meat is two people. It's me and Chris. That's it. That, that's the only people who are actually solidly involved in the whole damn thing. Every one of the volunteers that comes in and helps, absolutely. But the pre-prep for the show, it's primarily me and Chris. And yeah, we need to do better with that. We need to get more people in, but more people. I don't want to bring people in and say, please do this for free. It's not the way forwards. You've got to give people what they need for their time. And that's how it is. So yeah, 5th of December, more events coming. Watch the Twitter, watch the Facebook, watch the webpage. We're actually updating it this year. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm supposed to update my webpage. It's in the works right now. And it's a lot of work and it's very complicated. So for, that's why you, when you mentioned uh, doing an eBay page, I was like, that sounds with payment system and everything. And people... Uh, <laughs> 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 gives you a shudder just thinking about it yeah well thank you so much John for joining uh, thank you for I look me. forward to attending uh, Dragon Meat in, uh, in digital form I look and, forward to seeing you there yeah and uh, hopefully uh, Dragon Meat will be the first oh, maybe not the first but at least Dragon Meat will take place physically next year and we can uh, at least I would hope uh, it's not hit our elbows if, if I'm honest I hope that at least Aircon at least Aircon, at least Eastercon, and then see where we go from there. For me, another six months of this? Nope. Yeah, well, to be honest, yeah, I mean, the the news about the Dragon Meat, uh, I sort of expected it somewhat uh, quite a while ago. I was hoping. We were holding and holding and hoping, and then they sent the schools back and... Yeah, no, it's, it's... Everyone in the world could have seen that. I mean, if anyone's watching, I'm not making a political statement, I'm just saying you send schools back, guess what? I mean, it's, yeah, but, it's. Uh, I mean, at this point, I'm I'm trying to prepare my parents with the notion that Christmas is not happening. I, I really, I mean, we'll yeah. see, but I, I really, really, really doubt I will travel to Belgium uh, for yeah. Christmas uh, because it's even worse there than it is here. And really? it's and it's yeah. way worse than it was during the first peak, like way way Seriously? worse. Oh yeah, sure. um, uh, well everywhere in terms of cases, everywhere is w- we far above what we were before. Uh, I can send you the scale later, but it's it's logarithmic, so it's twice yeah. as high. But it doesn't mean it's twice as bad. It's five times as bad because it's it's actually. Mm. Uh, uh, it's logarithmic. It's a, uh, I don't know <laughs> to explain it. Other words, if but... all the tracing systems actually worked properly, so we'd have a good picture. Yeah, so at, at yeah. first with the peak, it was like, okay, death. Guess, thankfully, deaths were quite low, but now they start seriously picking up. So uh, yeah. it's not great. It's really not great. We, no. we were hoping for Dragon Meat to be the, the first convention, uh, the last and the yeah, first so this year. But that's now... why we did all the work for it. But when, when the numbers started going back up again, we just thought, yep. That's it's not going to happen. So, yeah. crossing fingers but for 2021. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, John, worse than 2020. Uh, thanks for people. No problem at all. Yeah. Thanks to people who joined us. Uh, Shavanter, sorry uh, if I missed question you might have asked in the, the chat room. Thanks, Mira. Uh, everybody, everyone's have... got my email. Just tell me, I'll answer. <laughs> I yeah, and I will put your 
your Twitter and the link to the Dragon Meat uh, website in the description of this episode so people can fetch it. Right. And I will include, I will draw a link to the episode about CyberConf and other conventions like we mm, already definitely. covered in Café Rollist. And uh, people mm. can go check it out and, and make up their mind and get in touch with each other, network, uh, do this thing. We should do a, a when seminar. When they've got ideas, come and tell us. <laughs> this is what we need. We need the ideas. We need the ideas. Do we need ideas? I, you know, I'm not a proponent of do. ideas. I find the, the oh, notion of ideas. idea overrated. The why we have a podcast zone, I wonder why that was. Did someone have an idea? Someone had the idea, but a lot of work was done. And <laughs> But someone had the idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, someone rejected a lot of ideas also <laughs> to keep it happening. And at some point... But some, nonetheless. Yeah. And at this point, somebody else took on the idea, which is more important mm -hmm. than uh, just having exactly. random ideas. Thank you so much, Mira, for running the podcast zone. All right. Okay. This is bye. Thanks, John. Bye. Take care.